In this video I'll teach you about the basics of inductors and inductance. Then we'll look at designing our own inductors from scratch. I'll also demonstrate the destructive voltage spikes inductors can cause so you know how to avoid blowing up your circuits. Fortunately for me, I live in a part of the world where PCBs grow in the wild, but you might not be so fortunate, but that's okay because this video's sponsor is JLC PCB and they've got you covered. JLC PCB is one of the largest PCB manufacturers in the world. Personally, I've always been impressed with the quality and affordability they offer. JLC PCB now offer SMT assembly service, allowing their customers to receive complete ready-to-use circuit boards right out of the box without the need to solder fiddly surface mount components. With a multitude of design options, fast production time, and with 5 PCBs costing less than a cup of coffee, give JLC PCB your next PCB project. Did you know when current passes through a wire it produces a magnetic field that wraps around the wire? In most instances this magnetic field is very weak and goes largely unnoticed. Now we all know that magnets and magnetic fields are particularly attracted to ferrous metals like this iron bolt. I used a file to produce some fine iron filings. Due to their small size they should be attracted to even relatively weak magnetic fields. After connecting this light bulb to my power supply there is about 5 amps of current passing through the wire. However I can't see any filings being attracted to the wire. Seems the magnetic field is just too weak here. Hmm. Well let's make a coil then. By making a coil of wire the magnetic field intensity increases with every turn of wire. After winding a couple hundred turns let's connect the coil to my power supply and try again. And would you look at that. The iron filings are being picked up by the magnetic field around the coil. And if I switch off the power, the filings drop away as the magnetic field collapses. This magnetic field is what makes an inductor so useful. You could think of the magnetic field around an inductor as a form of energy storage. Inductors come in many form factors and sizes, but fundamentally they are all similar. Essentially an inductor is made from enameled copper wire wrapped around a ferrite or iron core. But how does inductors store and release energy from the magnetic fields they generate? Well that's a good question. When we think about energy storage you might think of something like a capacitor or battery. For example capacitors can be charged up and even when disconnected from their power source capacitors can hold their charge long after. Inductors can't store energy when disconnected from a power supply but they do something else pretty interesting. When disconnected, an inductor rapidly dumps all of its energy into one big voltage spike that lasts for only a fraction of a second. To demonstrate this, I'll connect my scope probe across this inductor, then connect my power supply across the inductor as well. My power supply is set to output 1 amp of current. Ok, so at this point we have 1 amp of current flowing through the inductor. Now watch what happens when I disconnect the inductor from my power supply. The scope captures a snapshot of what just happened the moment I disconnected the power. This voltage spike was a massive 452 volts. This voltage spike is called flyback. But how does flyback occur? Well inductors can act similar to a spring. Let me explain. If I compress a spring I'm storing potential energy in the spring. Then when I release it the spring releases all of its stored energy in a single burst flying across the workshop into a black hole never to be seen or heard of again. When an inductor has current flowing through it, it's storing potential energy in the form of a magnetic field, similar to that of compressing a spring. Then when I disconnect the power, the energy stored in the magnetic field around the inductor rapidly converts back into electrical energy that results in a huge voltage spike, aka flyback, similar to that of releasing a compressed spring. Flyback isn't just limited to inductors. Relays and motors are also inductive loads and can cause flyback just like inductors can. Let's see the flyback produced from this 5 volt relay. 
I mean, it's so tiny and cute. There's no way this could produce a massive voltage spike. I mean, come on. Okay, well, scratch that then. This tiny relay produced a massive 356 volt voltage spike, all from being powered from a mere 5 volts with 70 milliamps of current flowing through its coil. And I'm sure you can imagine how destructive these high voltage spikes can cause to other electronic components if they share a connection with the relay's coil. Basically, if flyback were a person, it would look something like this. <laughs> <laughs> Preventing flyback is fairly simple. Placing a diode backwards to the power source across the inductor slash coil allows the flyback to flow through the diode when power is disconnected from the inductor or coil. To demonstrate this I'll use this SB540 Schottky diode which can handle a peak surge current of 220 amps. Which might sound like a massive overkill, but in reality, the flyback from an inductor this size could easily get close to or even exceed this figure under certain conditions. I'll solder the diode across my inductor, then connect it to my scope and power supply, and repeat the test. With the addition of the diode, the flyback voltage spike is significantly reduced down to a mere 1.76 volts, compared to before at 452 volts without the diode. The same principle can be applied to the relay. Choosing an appropriately sized diode capable of handling high surge currents is necessary in many applications. However, in the case of my relay here, a common 1N4001 diode should be able to handle the flyback from this relay without an issue. This time the flyback from the relay was a mere 560 millivolts, compared to 356 volts without the diode. So now you know how to deal with flyback from inductors and inductive loads. Moving on, what applications are most suited for inductors? Well in the case of buck converters or switch mode power supplies, inductors are used to help smooth out voltage ripple caused by their high switching frequency. Voltage ripple is never a good thing. Besides inductors, large electrolytic capacitors are used to smooth out the unwanted ripple on the output. I'm connecting this buck converter up to my scope so we can take a look at the voltage ripple on its output. The yellow flat line across the screen is the 8 volts DC output from the buck converter, and these voltage spikes you can see here is the undesirable voltage ripple on the output. The voltage ripple measures around 72 millivolts peak to peak, which for the price I paid for the buck converter is actually pretty good. Before we move on to making our own inductors, first I want to make my own buck converter based on the XL4016 buck IC. I ordered some PCBs from who other than JLC PCB and gathered the required components and soldered everything in place except the inductor. If you'd like to build one for yourself, check out the link in the video's description. To understand how important the inductor is in a buck converter circuit, I've soldered in a wire jumper where the inductor would normally be connected, effectively deleting the inductor from the circuit. After connecting my scope to the buck converter's output and powering it from my power supply, we can see just how awful the voltage ripple is on the output at over 8 volts peak to peak. The voltage is also all over the place and completely unfit for purpose. To make matters worse, even though the test was limited to a few seconds, the buck IC is getting very hot. Time to unsolder the wire jumper and replace it with an appropriately sized inductor. After reconnecting my scope and power supply to the buck converter, we can see this time around we've got a pretty clean output with only 160 millivolts of ripple. Comparing the two tests side by side, you should be able to appreciate just how important an inductor is in a buck converter circuit. Alright, now we've got a platform for testing, let's move on to making a couple different inductors to test. First off, we need to choose a toroid ring. Besides different sizes, toroids come in a wide variety of material options. Choosing what material is right for your application can be the difference between success and failure. The black toroids I have here are made from L8 ferrite, and are more suited towards noise suppression applications, while the green slash blue toroids are HY2 material made from powdered iron and are more suited for power inductor applications such as in buck converters. Both types of toroids are very attracted to magnets. The only other thing we'll need is enameled copper wire. I'm using 1mm thick copper wire which is suitable for the current I'll be drawing from my buck converter. 
Using a thicker wire than required will mean you may have to use a larger toroid, wasting valuable real estate in your projects, while on the other hand using a wire that's too thin may lead to overheating, so choose your wire gauge carefully. There is a really useful inductor calculator on coil32.net. It makes calculating the number of turns of wire really simple. First I'll enter the inductance I require, which for my application is 47 microhenry. That is the recommended inductance according to the manufacturer of the buck IC I'm using. Next I'll measure my toroid ring using a pair of calipers to measure the outside, inside as well as the height of the ring. After entering all my measurements we come down to magnetic permeability. The magnetic permeability will depend on what material your toroid is made from, and the magnetic permeability should be provided by the manufacturer. In my case the magnetic permeability for my HY2 toroid is 75. Lastly we enter the wire diameter which in my example is 1mm and then press calculate. So this is how many turns of wire are required around the toroid and this is the overall length of wire required. I measured out and cut a length of wire slightly longer than calculated to allow an error margin and then started to wind the wire around the toroid. Take your time here and try to keep each turn of wire neat and tidy. As you can see I was very close to running out of room on this toroid. I just managed to squeeze in the right amount of turns. Now let's do the same for my L8 toroid ring. The major difference between my two toroids is the magnetic permeability. This time it's 900. Ultimately this means less turns are required compared to the HY2 toroid. After cutting the wire to length and wrapping it around the toroid, I used sandpaper to remove the enamel insulation from the wire. In theory these two toroids have identical inductance, yet as you can see one has much more wire than the other, so it'll be interesting to see how these two inductors perform against one another. Before we put them to the test I wanted to verify I did everything correctly by measuring their inductance with my component tester. Now full disclosure this tester isn't super accurate nor does it offer fine resolution for measuring inductance, but all I want to know is if I'm pitching in the right ballpark. First I used a commercially made 47 microhenry inductor to verify my tester's accuracy or perhaps lack thereof, and it measures in at 0.05 millihenry, which converted is 50 microhenry. Hmm, not bad. Ok now let's test my L8 inductor and it measures in at 0.05 millihenry as well. And lastly my HY2 inductor also measures in at 0.05 millihenry. So all three of these inductors have approximately the same inductance. Now we can move on to testing them. Let's start with the HY2 inductor. I'll connect my buck converter to my power supply which is supplying 22 volts. I'll use my multimeter to measure the output of the buck converter and adjust the output to 6 volts DC. With that done I connected my scope probe to the output so we can take a closer look at how much ripple is on the output. With no load on the output the ripple is 280 millivolts. Ok let's use this 12 volt 50 watt halogen bulb as a load. A halogen bulb is an ideal load for this type of testing scenario because the bulb is a resistive load with next to zero inductance. That is very important because we won't be introducing any unwanted noise into the equation. With the addition of the halogen bulb drawing current, the voltage ripple has increased to almost 600 millivolts. Finally, I'll raise the output voltage to 10 volts and reconnect the halogen bulb. Due to the increase in voltage from 6 to 10 volts, the bulb will be drawing more current. This time the ripple is slightly lower than before at just under 500 millivolts. I then swapped out the HY2 for the L8 inductor and repeated the same test just like before. 6 volts no load, 6 volts with load, then finally 10 volts with load. And here are all the test results. Comparing the HY2 and L8 inductors side by side, with no load the L8 inductor reduced the ripple by more than half compared to its counterpart. However under load the HY2 started to show its strength by keeping the ripple below 500 millivolts compared to the L8 inductor which suffered greatly under load. I also wanted to briefly mention the buck converter I built in this video had rather high voltage ripple on its output. In a future video I'll explain how inductance can cause issues in your circuits and how adding decoupling capacitors can improve the performance of your circuits. 
With the addition of two capacitors I was able to reduce the ripple down to a mere 26 millivolts and the PCB Gerber files available for download have been updated to include the additional capacitors. The takeaway from this exercise today is there is no one size fits all solution, so do your research before buying inductors or start making your own. Most manufacturers provide detailed data sheets explaining what applications their inductors are most suited for. And if there's only two things you learn from this whole video, it should be that inductors basically have no effect on DC power. Inductors only affect AC power, or in other words, ripple. And inductors don't affect voltage, rather an inductor resists sudden changes in current flow, which in turn can help smooth out unwanted voltage ripple. So if you found this video useful, please give it a like, it would be much appreciated, it helps out massively. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, leave them down in the comments section below. Thank you very much to my supporters on Patreon, you guys rock, you help make content like this video possible, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye for now.